title of my talk originally was the work of poetry in the age of uh, Ferguson and Baltimore toward a kleptopoetics. Uh, but I think due to the events of this week, I, I changed my talk a bit. And I've changed it to the work of art in the age of Ferguson, Baltimore, and we have to add Charleston. One, what is the work of art in an age when a young white man sits through a prayer meeting in Charleston, South Carolina, at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church on a warm spring night and once the final benediction has been given by the black minister and the final amen disappears into the damp air, the young white man decides to murder the black parishioners that gathered around him in prayer for fellowship. What is the work of poetry in this age of brutality? When I say work, I mean, what shall we ask of the poem, of the story, of the essay? How shall our work encounter, explore, and interrogate these moments, these images? How do we, poets, fiction writers, essayists, write our poems, stories, and essays that engage the political and sociological spectacle of police brutality against black and brown bodies, engage US imperialism, engage neoliberal excess exported as diplomacy and goodwill without reproducing the spectacle, reproducing the wounds of the initial instantiation of violence, without uncritically reproducing what it is we seek to confront and possibly dismantle and subvert. And here, I can't help but think of uh, Kenny Goldsmith. I don't know if you guys know who he is as a performance poet who recently decided at a conference similar to this at Brown University to read the autopsy of Michael Brown as a performance piece, right? The, the young man that was killed in Ferguson. But he does peculiar things like he ends his performance with Michael Brown's penis and the exploration of Michael Brown's penis. How do we become more than artful voyeurs to borrow Seamus Heaney's phrase from Punishment, a poem in which Heaney at once empathizes with a woman who was killed for adultery, but also affirms that if he were there during the stoning and hanging of this adulterer, he would have, com but he would have been complicit in her torture and punishment. He himself, the artful voyeur, not immune to such violence. What are the ethics of reproducing violence? What pleasure do I, the poet, fiction writer, essayist, offer my reader when I render a meditation on the murder of Eric Garner or Walter Scott or Rakia Boyd? What pleasure do I offer you through the act of making a poem, something for you to find pleasure in? Right, and when I say pleasure, I don't mean pleasure in a way like eating a cookie or a piece of cake, right? We have to understand, I'm thinking about pleasure and what it means to enjoy, right? So when you buy a book, Right, and you read it, you get to do with that book what you will. You can put it down, you can read up to 20 pages, right? That's a way, that's a way of enjoying your property, right? And when, we, when I make a poem and I give it to my audience, I give them that opportunity to enjoy it, to find pleasure in that way. What luxuries am I afforded as the writer of the elegy and of the meditation? What privilege am I ignoring? Two, this is gonna seem a little weird. I would like to have a discussion about Facebook. While Facebook might not seem immediately relevant to a discussion of art and the image in an age of brutality, I hope to show you that it is. As Jericho Brown pleads in again uh, in his first collection, just give me a minute, give a man a minute. Whenever an act of violence occurs, an act of violence that galvanizes a community or corroborates a grand narrative of American history, i.e. terrorism post 9-11, the continued oppression of black people via white supremacy, Facebook becomes the public space of engagement. From solidarity to empathy, from engaged commentary to quick quips that seek to dismiss the magnitude of the event, status updates concerning the moment blanket our feeds. Often we witness the same news story images and videos cited and recited over and over again through what Facebook likes to call sharing, which leads to what has been rightly declared as going viral. For instance, how often did we have to watch Eric Garner choked to death by New York City police officer Eric Pantaleo? Or more recently, how often did the video of Walter Scott being shot in the back and then planted with a gun by a North Charleston police officer, Michael Slager, inundate our timelines? 
often this going viral, this inundation is, perfor is performed by many as acts of support for the victims and those that feel victimized by these sorts of events. Often these status of states discuss how the individual feels heartbroken, bereft, overwhelmed, and sad that this event X occurred. Then below a statement of solidarity appears the video, image or article that discusses that event. While I do appreciate the spirit of this sort of engagement, the desire to denounce the violence, I would argue that the reproduction of the video, images, and photographs of the dead as they are being murdered actually do nothing but perform the spectacle of going viral, uncritically trafficking and reproducing the violence that said individual or status update seeks to repudiate and denounce. Often these status updates do nothing more than traffic in the spectacle as such, as a way of participating in community, as a means of connecting to one another via our, via our collective wounds and woundedness. What is often jettisoned and made invisible is the individual suffering of those that actually experienced and continue to experience the violence. What is foregrounded is the bereft, the sad and overwhelmed feelings of the one who made the status update. And what is more insidious about going viral in this fashion is the alacrity with which what is viral in one moment becomes old news in the next. We, we can't help but think about, for instance, how quickly we move from the overly aggressive actions of an officer in McKinney, Texas, to Rachel Dolezal, to the church shooting in Charleston, to whatever's gonna happen next week. We hop from one tragedy to the next, ready to discuss how heartbroken we are, or disgusted we are, or angry we are, then a photo of a cat stuck in a paper bag or an eagle swooping down from the heavens and snatching a child from a mother's arm seems to distract us. And what might this have to do with craft or the work of art in the age of such brutality? These Facebook, these Facebook statuses teach us exactly what not to do how not to make poems. First, let's begin with the reproduction of violence. How do we as artists engage violence, particularly historically difficult to discuss violence, in our work without seeming to uncritically invoke what we seek to undo? How might one ethically engage violent imagery without reinforcing or championing the brutality? Here is where we turn back to Seamus Heaney for a moment in his poem, Punishment. So Seamus Heaney writes a series of poems about uh, bodies that are found in a bog. And one of these bodies is of an adulterer. Um, and it's one of my favorite poems because I think it teaches me how to deal with uh, brutality and violence that is culturally sanctioned. And so I'll read it a bit. Uh, yeah, we have time. Punishment. I can feel the tug of the halter at the nape of her neck, the wind on her naked front. It blows her nipples to amber beads. It shakes the frail rigging of her ribs. I can see her drowned body in the bog, the weighing stone, the floating rods and boughs, under which at first she was a barked sampling, sapling that is dug up, oak bone, brain firkin, her shaved head like a stubble of black corn, her blindfold a soiled bandage, her noose a ring, to store the memories of love. Little adulteress, before they punished you, you were flaxen haired, undernourished, and your tar black face was beautiful. My poor scapegoat, I almost love you, but would have cast, I know, the stones of silence. I am the artful voyeur of your brains exposed in darkened combs, your muscles webbing and all your numbered bones. I who have stood dumb when your betraying sisters called in tar, wept by the railings, who would connive in civilized outrage, yet understand the exact and tribal, intimate revenge. Isn't that a beautiful poem? And that's exactly the trouble and problem of the poem, a trouble that Heaney is keenly aware of and in fact builds the second half of the poem, or the latter third of the poem, engaging. Engaging the making of horror, tragedy, and violence beautiful. Haney turns the poem away from the body of the young, undernourished adulterer and turns his gaze inward, and at the same time, outward toward us, the spectator, the viewing public. Punishment begins with a sort of ogling of the adulteress's body. We encounter the halter at the nape of the neck, the naked and exposed torso. 
We even encounter the wind blowing her nipples to amber beads. Heaney reanimates the dead body. However, in reanimating the body, the body becomes his puppet. The body becomes fungible, emptied out for Heaney's imaginings and his projections. In other words, Heaney inhabits her body with his imagination, an imagination that eroticizes the dead in a necropolitical, excuse me, necropastoral sort of fashion. But even as Heaney sensuously reproduces the violence, he critiques his artistic re-rendering of the adulteress's tortured demise. Quite simply, he calls out his own voyeuristic tendency when he announces that I almost love you, but would have cast I know the stones of silence. I am the artful voyeur of your brain exposed in darkened combs, your muscles webbing, and all your numbered bones. At this moment in the poem, Heaney not only critiques his reproduction of violence via writing the lyric, making art for an audience, thereby giving pleasure, providing a spectacle, but he also critiques his subject position, that of the historically and anachronistically placed witness, a witness who can, from his subject position, condemn the act because of historical and situational detachment, because he is modern. However, Heaney calls this position of witness from afar into question, and he does not occupy the seat of the scornful, the self-righteous observer who argues that he would not have thrown stones and helped to torture this young adulteress. Instead, placed alongside the betraying sisters, Heaney implicates himself in the act. He too would have participated in the exact and tribal intimate revenge. It is here where Heaney implicates himself in communal violence that he, have, that he might have much to teach us as writers seeking to confront brutality, torture, and violence. What Heaney manages in this moment is reifying physicalizing his poetic imagination, a subjectivity of sorts, and puts it in relationship to the adulteress's body and torture. Rather than pretending that Heaney, his speaker, or his poetic imagination do not affect the material of the lyric, affect our encounter with the poem, Heaney draws back the curtain. He wants us to understand as the, he wants, us, he wants to under, us to understand as the artful voyeur, he crafts and determines our experience. In other words, words make us they make the body in front of us. The formal decisions in the poem create the encounter. Thus, Heaney draws our attention to the artifice and artificiality of the encounter and simultaneously to the spectacle of it. In this act of self-consciousness, Heaney demonstrates for us quite literally the limit limitedness of his empathy, the limits of what a poem can actually recover. However, this reminder that Heaney gives us is not done pessimistically but performs quite the opposite effect. Heaney in this moment, through this act of self-consciousness, reminds us, the reader, of our complicity in these historical traumas and acts of violence, whether we participate in the actual act or benefit from it. Occupying the position of the artful voyeur, Heaney implicitly chides and reminds us of our own limitations and how might we as spectators, readers, take unwitting pleasure and enjoyment in the torture of the young adulteress through our reading of the poem. Heaney seems to be aware of the unwitting manner in which poetry can participate in the reinscription of violence that it seeks to critique or dismantle. Rather than Heaney ending the poem with a mere description of the body of the adulteress, ending the poem in the sixth stanza where he declares, you were flaxen haired, undernourished, and your tar black face was beautiful, which was similar to which would be similar to us as Facebook users just cutting and pasting a link of the video of Eric Garner being choked to death by New York City police officer Eric Pantaleo to our feeds, Heaney contextualizes the violence through interrogating the very words and images that reconstitute the event. Heaney understands that the event of the violence occurs twice, in its first instantiation and then again in the verse. And I would argue that anytime we are re-rendering violence, we are actually making it anew. Right? That gets to what Jenny was talking about, how we are actually making this thing. And as the purveyor of the second instantiation of violence, he refuses to allow it to occur uncritically, without the proper fame or means of interrogation. We, as artists who might seek to engage this age of brutality, must understand that we are not merely representing the violence, but are ourselves making violence via the event of the poem. So what is it that we take from Heaney? What does Heaney offer us or teach us in the way of craft? Answer, a self-conscious and self-critiquing pen. Heaney reminds us that we do not sit outside the violence, that we ourselves are implicated in the making of violence, particularly state violence. Often this violence is made on our behalf. Think 
the war on terror. Think Homeland Security. Think NSA's egregious usurpation of individual citizens' privacy via phone taps. Think Dylan Roof, the Charleston shooter who killed nine black people in a church in order to start another civil war. Think NAFTA. Think Afghanistan. Think the criminalization of undocumented workers and immigrants. Think Desert Storm. Think America in the latter half of the 20th century. So much violence has been waged in our name. We are no different than the betraying sisters in Heaney's poem, the sisters who wept and yet would connive in civilized outrage, understanding the exact and tribal intimate revenge. Though we beat our breast in sorrow on Facebook, even sometimes in our poetry, I wonder if we are not these sisters who wail and wail for show, for sport, as a means of expressing our civilized outrage. Yet shortly after posting our statuses, we turn our backs from the disaster and go on with our lives, ready to rage against the next disaster and do nothing.